a gun in the face. Then all of a sudden, they all kind of lined up. They pointed their guns at me. And this is the point where I thought, I'm going to die today. Started two years of horror for an American in Venezuela. They said, you need to give us your phone and get ready because you're coming with us. I'm Becky Bruce, and I spent a year researching and piecing together Josh and Tammy Holt's story about their ordeal in a notorious prison. That's when everything started to turn bad. We had another pound on the door. Boom, boom, boom. And there was the police once again. You can binge all of the episodes of Hope in Darkness on kslpodcasts.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Project Recovery. I am Casey Scott. That right there, Dr. Matt Woolley. How you doing, Casey? You know, we're right in the bio, and uh, it says licensed psychologist. Yeah? Why don't you want people to know you're licensed? Well, I don't care if people know I'm licensed. Do you feel like you're bragging? It just, you know, too many words. I've, I'm, I'm from the writing school of less is more, so fewer words in any paragraph. I think a better writer can, can convey the message with fewer words. Why did it take you so long to convey that? Because I'm not that good at it. <laughs> okay, yeah. good. We got try, that. That's why I'm getting words out. Let me ask you this, too. Why are you doing a Project Recovery podcast when it's just tired and boring? Um, <laughs> well, so interestingly enough, I had that conversation with another doctor yesterday. Um, because I don't – because we're not going to make it tired and boring. But it is a, something that still needs to be talked about. It's a bigger problem. It affects problem. so many people. Every year it gets bigger and bigger. So I, I tell people – I think I mentioned it on the first show – I am not an addictions specialist. That is not all I do every day. But every day I talk with people about addictions. Every day. Because that's people either themselves, their family members, their friends. They're dealing with some types of addictions, whether it's a behavioral addiction uh, like gambling or pornography or sexual things or substance abuse. And so many of the people I work with are younger so adolescents and young adults, and they're in the process of starting addictions. You know, they're coming in talking to me about like, hey, Dr. Woolley, uh, vaping's cool, right? It's okay. It's not really smoke. Yeah, it's not a problem, right? You know, and so we have to have those conversations because they don't know, and, and they're getting hooked. So All right. I am, I am fully invested in making this interesting and uh, applicable to everybody's lives because everybody deals with it. Is vaping a gateway drug? I, in my opinion, it is. I, I would say that the research on it is still very sketchy because vaping's fairly new. So if you want to jump into the research, if you're one of those guys, which I am, you're going to find mixed messages. But in practical clinical terms, I think most people who work, any sort of doctor or nurse that works with people would tell you that, yeah, over time, you start vaping and you want to try other things. You know, because I'm gonna, I don't know if I talked about this on the last podcast, but uh, I had some family members uh, and, and, and their sons started vaping. Yeah. And when they started vaping, they sold it to their parents that there was no nicotine in there. And, uh, right, and, right. And, and, and the family members like, hey, there's no nicotine in there. And I was like, dude. You know that it's going to eventually have nicotine in there. Right. After a while, you know, it gets boring just doing the, the tasty air, I guess, or whatever it is. Yeah, the first Smurf farts. Yeah. So, yeah, there you go. You know what I mean? Because they do got all these weird names, you know, and, and, and they are flavored to taste better. And yeah. I've talked about this before. I come from the era when alcohol tasted bad and smoke burned your lungs, and that's what you wanted. Right. That's, and, and you were a man. Oh, wow. no, 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 I wasn't a man. <laughs> but, you know, so I think that... Uh, Everything tastes fruity nowadays. Right? Yeah. But Fruity Pebbles, never buy the knockoff Fruity Pebbles. No, it's worth going for the real deal. I was going for that the... extra dollar and a half. Sorry. I was going for the big bag, you know, yeah. the, the kind of ghetto stuff. On the stuff. bottom shelf. Yeah. yeah, and I was like, my kids won't know. And my son, <laughs> who's know. seven, goes, Dad, these taste waxy. And I was like, how do you know the word waxy? And he goes, Because you've been feeding me bottom shelf pebbles. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be a great rap name. <laughs> Bottom shelf pebbles. Uh, yeah, I like that. Hey, so but I feel like I'm a lot, uh, a lot of the time defending our podcast too. And uh, the funny thing is, it hasn't been out for that long, but people do say that. Why now? Why are you doing this? And I think the answer is one. 
we're not trying to fix you. We just want to tell you what options are out there. And I think as technology and uh, the understanding of the mind uh, increases, that there's other ways out there to help mm-hmm. people deal with their uh, addictions. Well, and you know, to answer your question a little more personally, um, partly I want to do this because you're my friend. Well, and I appreciate and, that. And you've gone through this, and your process of going through it, I've been really impressed with because it's been not traditional. You know, the reasons that you had a problem with drinking were probably not what most people think of as the traditional, typical reasons a person drinks. Mm -hmm. And then the way you've become sober and gone through your process is a little bit different than the typical 12-stepper, you know, kind of program. And so I want people to know there, there are really successful options out there on the treatment end, but also on the front end, I, as a psychologist, want people to realize what they're doing and how they may be developing addictive behaviors before, you know, before it's too late, before they need a rehab program. Now, do you know the term pink cloud? Uh, not, n- no. Okay, uh, so it's not a vaping thing. Okay. Okay, so when you're in the recovery world and you're living in a rehab center, like I was at Pinnacle uh, Recovery, uh-huh. okay, uh, they often say you're living in a pink cloud. Okay. And so you hear it about three times and then you finally ask, well, what is this pink cloud <laughs> yeah. you guys are talking about? And a pink cloud is... It's in a perfect world. You're living mm. in this recovery center, and all your needs are tended to. Uh, you're getting the help that you need. You're getting the sole time just to focus in on you and your problems and figure it out. So you even had like dietitians, dietitians, and exercise, exercise yeah. ping pong table, uh, badminton court. Uh, I mean, it, I, it was it living was, the badminton dream, right? Yeah, there. I yeah. was too, and it was, and it was great. But they say you live in a pink cloud because right now everything's perfect, mm-hmm. and it's kind of uh, what was the truth. Truman Show with uh, oh yeah with you, Jim Carrey you know what I mean yeah. you had all these people protecting you mm-hmm. and, and but it's false right not false but well, not not but not real life not real life yeah. because all of a sudden it's you a contrived controlled environment yeah and it's and it's and it's designed to get you into the best headspace possible mm-hmm. deal with your problems. And then give you some knowledge so when you go on the outside you can implement that and kind of you know. Use that as a good base ground, base zero, mm-hmm. okay, yep. um, ground zero, I should say. And so they say you're living in a pink cloud. And and for those who have never been in that, I can liken it to if you guys remember the Rocky movies. Vaguely, yes. Okay, so <laughs> you know, anytime you went into a Rocky movie, as soon as you got out, you thought you could box, and oh, you yeah. thought you were the toughest man on the planet. Go chug some raw eggs. Yeah, and and right. but it, it, find some steps to run up. But that was just short lived until you ran into someone who was a lot bigger than you. It's like, yeah, no, I don't think <laughs> yeah, I want to fight this no. guy. Yeah. So that's the pink cloud. So you're living in this pink cloud, and then you get out, and then all of a sudden you have all these external problems coming in. Real life hits you. Bills yeah. catch up. Uh, you know, relationships and all that stuff. And so this is designed as a way to kind of give you a good ground zero and let you know the options are out there. Now, the options we're going to throw at you aren't going to help you uh, completely. No, and I think I think people have to get out of that one-and-done mindset. It's not necessarily one option. It's, have, it's changing your life mm-hmm. and using a variety of tools and options that are available to you and being willing to try different things out until you find what works for you. You know, a lot of people on my Facebook page, one step at a time, Casey, mm-hmm. you know, and that's coming from the 12-step program. Right. Uh, I Googled recovery quotes, and so I'm oh, going to share did. some of these with you. Yeah, nice. yeah. Recovery is not for people who need it. It's for people who want it. Uh-huh. And you hear a lot of these as you go around. Yeah, Everybody's yeah. got their favorite quotes that they're going to mm-hmm. throw at you. It's going to get harder before it gets easier, but it'll get better. You just got to make it through the hard stuff first. It, it's more the look on your face that's making me laugh. Right. Maybe. But you can see these on yeah. Facebooks and memes. For sure. yeah. And you know what? The thing is, is that in its simplest form, these are true. Yeah. You know, and, and, and there is some good stuff in it. But a lot of people just go, well, I'm saying the quote. No, you got to live the life. Yeah. Addiction is the disease that makes you too selfish to see the havoc you've created or care about the people whose lives you have shattered. Now, Kay, when I say it in that voice, it sounds like you're getting a smirk on your face, but the reality is... The is Jack Handy. Yeah, 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 you know what I mean? I'm good enough. <laughs> uh, but, that's, but that's the truth. I mean, addiction is a disease that makes you too selfish. I used to say to all, people all the time, what do you care? Yeah, I'm doing it to myself. Right. This is, this, you know... The, I'm not making you drink. And often I'm talking with in my office with people whose parent or sibling or child 
they're the ones with the addiction, but the person is affected and they're coming in and amongst other things, they're talking to me about how do I handle this and how stressful it is to people like the, the friends and relatives of the person who has the addiction. You know, my dad's been in advertising for 40 years, and about 30 years ago, he wrote this award-winning advertising piece, and I don't remember all of it, but the, the main gist of it was, I don't have a drinking problem, my, fram- my family does. Oh, okay. But, but, the, but the, and, and the point was is that the guy who's drinking doesn't think he has a problem. Right. Everybody else sees that he has a problem, and that creates a problem for them mm-hmm. because, one, they don't know how to help. Two, uh, they, yeah, I guess that's the, they don't know how to help. Well, they don't know how to help, and it also creates – I mean it depends on the nature of the relationship. But like in your case, you had kids, and it creates a level of insecurity for the kids. Dad – Mom and dad, parents need to be large and in charge, and they're taking care of the kid. And that creates a sense of security so that they can do their own growth and development. And so if mom or dad are struggling with something that rocks that feeling of security, then children are dealing with a lot of stress that they don't even know how to describe all the time. You know, I've talked about this all the time. My middle child, Frankie, uh, you know, I, I'm DJing. Uh, that's how I make some of my money. Right. And uh, a lot of times it's it's around people drinking and that. And uh when I get home from DJing, uh, whether she's at my house or she's at my ex-wife's house, she'll always call me or text me and say, no drinks, Dad? And I go, no drinks. Interesting. You know, and, 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 and I used to think, is, is she testing me? And then uh, through talking with you, I realized this is for her own sanity mm-hmm. because, you know, she's sitting at home wondering what Dad's doing, where he's doing. And mm-hmm. so I'll answer this question for the rest of your life, Frankie, and uh, I'll always be honest with you. And that's awesome because a lot of parents would get sick of – that they would personalize it and make it feel like, oh, why doesn't she trust me? And you're right. It's really about her kind of reestablishing a sense of uh, groundedness and security. Okay, dad isn't drinking. I, you know, And I'm assuming over the course of the next few months and maybe a year, that question will drop off and, and it won't be an issue anymore as long as yeah. you stay sober. And now my son, Bowden, um, he's seven, right when I got out of rehab. Uh, you know, I'd, everywhere I'd go with him. And it's funny, but it's sad because we'd, anywhere we'd go, uh, we'd go up to the, the Maverick and, 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 and get a coffee or a, or a soda pop and a, and, a, and a Slurpee. He'd go, this is my dad. He's not a drunk anymore. <laughs> and I was like, whoa. Uh, yeah. <laughs> my favorite is the seven-year-old's use of the word drunk. Yeah, yeah, because you know he didn't learn that himself. <laughs> right. But somehow it got to him, and that's how he perceived it. Yeah. And so at first I was like, how do I have this conversation with a seven-year-old? And so I was like, hey, uh, son, you know, you don't have to say that. And he goes, but you're not, Dad, right? And I go, no, yeah, no, I'm not. Right. And so – but to him – it's it's a pride thing. Absolutely. He's proud of his yeah. dad, you know, and, and he doesn't understand the words. And so we went to back to school night, and he was like, "Hey, there's my dad. He's not a drunk anymore." And I just turned around <laughs> and went, "He's right." And I gave him a thumbs up, you know, yeah. and just we kept awesome. going because yeah. that's the only thing I can do. Because you know, in his world, that's what's going on. And so to have a and that's grown up his conversation way of, with a of feeling secure, just like Frankie is asking you directly. Yeah, he's just making. Random proclamations to the world that dad's not a drunk. Yeah. Which is fit. Like, that is so cute. Yeah. And, and the coolest thing is you let him, like, you got to let him do it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to say, hey, don't say yeah, that yeah. because, you know, that's that was his world. And yeah. so I just kind of rock and roll yeah, with give it. Give him a thumbs up, a high five, and move on. Yeah. And buy that Slurpee. So I'll yeah. give you one more. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about 10 questions you should ask of any right. recovery center. Right. Because it, it, it's a world. How to navigate that. Yeah. Okay. If you find yourself in a hole, the first thing to do, stop digging. <laughs> I love it. But these are all true. But they are. But they're, but they're like – I think you and I have the same sense of humor. This kind of stuff strikes us as cheesy and funny. But they are true. But, you know, that would be something that uh, – I'd have vinyl on my wall. You know what I mean? Exactly. Like, oh, we're going to above, Casey's house. Above the fireplace. Yeah, uh, yeah. And yeah. I'll leave you with one more. It's not that some people have willpower and some don't. It's that some people are ready to change and others are not. But you know what? That's a great one to end on because that's the truth. Because only you can decide to change. Right. A lot of, there's a lot of support available, but you have to be invested. You know, my ex-wife used to say, why can't you quit for me? And uh, why can't you quit for the kids? And I go, hey, I tried. I, you know, I mean, I would sit there and have battles with myself all the time. You know, mm-hmm. just stop, just stop, just stop. You, you're going to lose this. You're going to do that. You know. But it wasn't until I had that aha moment, the rock bottom, looking up, siren lights, going, 
Yeah, this is this is no longer going to go. And you set the shovel down. I did. Quit digging. And I returned it to my neighbor because you know I don't own a shovel. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. Your neighbor is probably like, oh, I thought you hawked that. Yeah, stick around. <laughs> Twin questions to ask any recovery center. Project Recovery, a podcast about recovery in all aspects of your life. I'm Casey Scott. That's Dr. Matt Woolley. We talked about 10 questions to ask before you go into a recovery center. Right. And um, so I thought we'd go over some of these. Just so you know, right up front, uh, there may be other questions that are important to ask. If you have had experience with this or you actually are out right now trying to Find a recovery program for yourself or someone, and you have a question that we don't mention, we'd love to hear about it on our Facebook. That's right. Go to our Facebook page, DM us. That means direct message. Yeah, that's what the cool kids say. Yeah, DM us, and uh, we'll try to get to that. Because what got me thinking about this and you was before I went to Pinnacle Recovery Center and went to the Uni Detox Center, I had no idea about a recovery center or what a detox center was or anything about it. And as I walk in about and I talk to people, they tell me a lot of the times people pick recovery center because they've got a friend's friend whose kid went through it or a friend's wife went through it and seemed to have good success. And so that's kind of the Littman test for it. They go, oh, yeah, okay, that one sounds good. Yeah, yeah. But there's really all kinds of things that go into it. Is it a 12-step based? Is it a, a philosophical, a philosophy one? Yeah. Uh, is it a... Philosophical, I like that better. You do? Yeah, it sounded like falafel. Yeah. I, and now I'm hungry. What is falafel? It's, you know, that Middle Eastern food with the bread thing and th- then you got the meat in it. It's delicious. Wow. You are a wordsmith. <laughs> I'm really blowing it on the words today. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. All right. So what's question one? We've we should decided be... I'm not a wordsmith or a chef. And that's all right. What is question one we should ask when going and, to a recovery And I'll say center? these aren't in a particular order okay. of importance per se. Mm-hmm. Um, but in my experience working with people as well as what other people – Uh, in recovery would want you to know, I would say uh, a really great first question might be, can you provide me with a sample treatment plan? Now, that's not something people would normally ask, but if the program doesn't have a sample treatment plan that they couldn't email you or give you in person, that's kind of sketchy to me. What would be a treatment plan? Like an example. Well, it, it should be fairly detailed if it's a recovery program because it should go through all the different types of things that a person is going to be doing in their recovery. I mean, they should be able to provide that to you. And everybody's treatment plan may be able to be personalized, but there should be some standard things that that recovery program provides, and it should be able to be easily disseminated to families or to the individual. Is this when the word modality would come into play? <laughs> Treatment modalities? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Because yeah. I heard that a lot when I was in recovery. These are and the all modalities. That, and all that means is a different uh, type, you know, like, uh, you know, it's a different style of treatment. Like there's individual therapy and group therapy and, you know, there's things like meditation and there's 12 steps and there are these different types of modalities or types of something. So types of treatment. So what I'm hearing is that if you're uh, researching a recovery center or uh, a a program, Uh just send an email or call them and say, hey, look, I'd just like a sample plan. I'm interested. I'd really love to get a sample plan of your treatment program. And a good program, a good recovery center should be proud to hand that out. Okay. I mean, I know these people, uh, they develop these programs and they're proud of them. It's not proprietary? Oh, it can be, but like the the part they share with you shouldn't be. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. And uh, any any program that can't provide that to you, I would think maybe doesn't have their act together. Okay. All right. Question yeah. number two. Number two. Um, what kind of supervision do you offer? So when a person comes there, like, you know, is it a free-for-all? What kind of supervision? Like, how is it a locked facility? Is it an open facility? Like, what sort of oversight and supervision is going to be given? You're going to be there with other people that you don't know. Are you safe? <laughs> uh, from Like, a lot of people, like you mentioned, having to share a room. Is this a private room, a shared room? Is it a dormitory situation? What sort of supervision and safety kind of environment am I going to have? So, once again, I can only speak on my experience, which is with the Pinnacle Recovery center and uh, I had a shared room we uh, had a bathroom each uh, room had its own bathroom and the weirdest thing was and and I was there for 45 days uh, about 15 days into it after I started getting normal sleep and getting healthier I realized that they were checking on us 
every hour. There you go. Somebody was opening the door and mm-hmm. just making sure in there doing a head count. And, mm-hmm. you know, you'd walk around this place and any time you opened a door, you know, they'd get an alert on their phone or, you know, mm-hmm. front door is open. Yeah. Garage door is open. And, you know, the thing was is when I was at Pinnacle Recovery Center, you could leave whenever you wanted. Mm-hmm. You just walk out, right? Yeah, just walk out. You know what I mean? I mean, I there was curfews that we had to be in there. But if you didn't want to be there... Yeah. So it wasn't a lockdown facility, but they had complete supervision for be, being able to keep track of everybody. Yeah. And part of that is for your safety and to help make sure you're following their program. We were behind a gated wall in a gated community. And they said, you know, we, you know... You can walk around and you can do what you want in here, and there was places that you could go and you couldn't go. Mm-hmm. But once you left the gate, you were done. And if you wanted to get back in, you you'd had to reapply to the program. Reapply to the okay. program yeah. and pass the drug tests and do everything mm-hmm. that you needed because th- their utmost safety was everybody in the house. Yeah, and right, so right. They, they were accountable for everybody. Although you think that they're, they're, you know, they, they they do make you feel special and and cared for. But when you've got fifteen, eighteen people, you know, with mm-hmm. similar problems and the same thing, you've it's got a lot to manage. Yeah, and so and if it's a quality facility, they want everybody to have the best experience for them. And part of that is making sure you're following their program, you're safe. And that perhaps another person in the program who isn't following it maybe uh, doesn't have a negative influence on you. Yeah, disruptive. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Question number three. Uh, Number three is how much one-on-one therapy will you provide? So this is an important question, I think, because a lot of people who have gone to different uh, rehab programs and come out and had not a good experience, one of the things that I often hear from them is we just kind of sat around. And we didn't do a whole lot. And uh, maybe a doc would come talk to me once a week. uh, And, uh, you know, maybe we had group therapy. But the individual, like, getting into my own issues never happened. And so they'll come out and and they'll want to find a a therapist they can get into their own issues with. And I think that it's best if there is a fair amount, quite a lot of individual therapy going on in that program. While I was in recovery, you know, there was people in there that had been, this is their fourth recovery, their second, uh, you know, and so you start to get to talk with everybody and you, and you hear horror stories and you hear good things. And so you do that. And what I've heard from a lot of other recovery centers, this wasn't the case where I was, is that there was a lot of busy work and you would just sit there and they'd put you in front of a book and it was just, oh, yeah. it was the time, you know, they, they were just killing Work time. Sheets. Worksheets and busy work. And, yeah. uh, it, where I went to, we had uh, two sessions a week with a, a licensed therapist. Individual? Individual session? sessions. Okay. And uh, that was very helpful for me. That's where I really got to go inside my head and really do a deep dive into past problems and kind of figure out why I was drinking. Why Casey was drinking, yeah. right? Like, yeah. And, and that's a, a different question than why do people drink. So yeah. you probably had a ton of things in common with some of the people there. But a lot of stuff that was just your own stuff. Yeah. I mean, we all share a similar story in the fact that uh, we're there in rehab. But the 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 details and how we got there is a little bit different. Absolutely. And, and I, think, I think that's something that really should start in the rehab part and then carry on through afterwards. All right. Question number four. So number four is kind of building on that what types of group therapies are offered. And I think that's important. That kind of gets into where we were talking about giving people like we want in this show. I think we want to break down some of the stereotypes Mm -hmm. of of what we're talking about. One of the stereotypes, I think, is that you go sit around all day, watch TV, and then you get into a big group and everybody kind of yells at each other. Yeah. And so there are, you know, what kinds of group therapies are there? I'm sure there are going to be process therapy groups like that where you sit around and you have a facilitator and and something's going on. But what other kinds of group there are there? Things like art, music, uh, equine therapy. Those are horses. Okay. Um, you know, uh, you know, exercise therapy, uh, dietitians. Like what kinds of things that might not be considered a traditional sit around in a circle group therapy? What kind of group activities and therapies are? going to be happening or am I going to have a ton of downtime for 45 days and that that may not be good for most people and I can say once again only on my experience there wasn't a lot of downtime uh, we were busy and they did a great job yeah. of giving us a lot to, to and I work think with. that's what quality programs have in common is that uh, you have enough of your own downtime to not feel exhausted by the program but you are busy your mind and getting in and helping a person 
uh, become sober, part of that is developing insight. And we all develop insight in different ways. You know, there's talking about my own stuff directly, but through creative processes like art therapy and music therapy, I might actually be able to understand my situation in a way that just talking about it doesn't. Yeah, for me, the gym was a huge part of my recovery. Uh, it got me thinking about my body again, got me healthy, and uh, g- g- gave me time to get up inside my head and just kind of mm-hmm. internalize things. Yeah, for a lot of people, that's important. A lot of people live, you know, they're very physical people and they live in their body. And if you didn't have that option available in your recovery program, a lot of the athletes I've worked with that have needed to go to recovery, of course, if they don't ha- have that in their program, it's not going to be the best fit for them. All right, where are we going next? Um, let's do number five. Are we on number five? Yep. Uh, do you provide alternatives to 12 step programs? And again, 12 steps may be, um, very helpful for a lot of people. It may be part of a a rehabilitation program that you're in, but are there alternatives? Are there things different or beyond that might speak to a person? So we've mentioned, uh, in past, uh, episodes, Things like mindfulness and meditation, yoga, which is more of a physical yeah. experience, people who really like that physical, um, you know, are there things other than 12 steps? Because, again, that's another stereotype that people have is recovery means 12 steps. Yeah. And, you know, the thing is with 12 steps, a lot of times that I heard in my recovery was people are like, well, alcohol is not my drug of choice. It was meth. It was heroin. Right. It was cocaine. So we'd go to cocaine anonymous we'd go to narcotics anonymous Mm -hmm. now a lot of them were based in the 12-step philosophy and followed a little bit of the program but they were uniquely different and catered to that person's thing and so they were really Mm -hmm. good about showing us all these different things and to be honest with you uh i found that although i beer was mine Mm -hmm. narcotics anonymous i like that one better fit a little better for you yeah Yeah. you know because it was a little more light-hearted uh it wasn't so strict but i mean that was just for my liking and i think with a re a rehab program just for the listener you know a person is typically going to go into a rehab program right after they've hit a rock bottom Mm -hmm. had a big problem in life so it should be considered really a first step to a life change right and so it makes sense in that first step that a person is being introduced to lots of different kinds of treatment options and ways of life to live after they leave that program. If you're only introduced to one option, uh, even if that works for you, that, that that may not be the best long-term solution. It's like my son says, different strokes for different folks. Wow. And he says that and the word drunk. Yeah. I like this kid. He's a smart kid. you got to have him in. What's number six? Uh, this one is important to me, and that is, are patients being evaluated and or treated for other mental illness issues that may be influencing their addictions? Because so, a lot of times they go hand in hand. Absolutely. So a lot of times it's very common situation. The reason the person is self-medicating with their substance is because they have untreated depression, untreated anxiety, maybe trauma in their background that's never been addressed properly. Um, these sorts of things, marital issues, um, you know, grief issues. And if if you're not in a program that can at least evaluate and say, listen, when you leave our program, you know, we've evaluated that you meet, you know, clinical depression levels. You need this kind of treatment. Let's give you a referral. Like, at the very least, the evaluation should start in rehab. You know, and, and I was told a couple times in mine that uh, I was drinking because of my problems. Yeah. And then drinking became my problem. And it was a, a cycle that I just couldn't get out of. I think that's of. a really common story. Um, number seven would be what attention is paid to general health during the rehab. So like you've mentioned, exercise, things like diet and sleep. Are those uh, are they attending to that to kind we, of have a, a wholeness, a wellness program for the person? We had a nurse on call uh, 24-7, and we saw a doctor twice a week. Awesome. They yeah, came in and, and, and check your blood, and then every morning they would check your blood and, and all that Probably stuff. Probably take your heart rate and blood pressure, all yeah, that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, what level of involvement will family members have? That's important because a lot of the times you you uh, are getting sober, but then before you really are going to be successful in your sobriety when you leave the program, you're going to have to deal with the chaos you might have created. And how do family members, maybe you have family members, a spouse who's still drinking at home. Yeah. Like, uh, or how do your children feel about you now? You know, there are a lot of involvement that people are more successful in their sobriety if they 
have a better relationship with their families. And families usually want to be there. They want to give support. So in what way does the program involve families would be a great question. An example would be uh, once a week or once every two weeks, they'd have family members come down. And so you could talk to the therapist and the therapist could talk to them. And it was kind of, you know, because the family wanted to know why you're doing it. And it kind of just bridges the gap and helps Mm -hmm. you explain to them. And that was cool. And then every Sunday was family day and family day was encouraged for family to come down and you didn't do any classes and you just, and you just, you know, got to hang out. Yeah. That's, I think that's really important. Um, And the, Helping family members understand why you're doing what you're doing helps them support you in it. Okay. Right? A couple of quick ones, and then we'll t- uh, we can just kind of go through quickly. I think, you know, what licenses and accreditations does the facility and the individual providers have? And they don't go to a place that's not licensed and accredited. I just think that um, and there's they're not going to be around long anyway. There's different tiers, right? right? And so how would we know what's the top tier, what's the low tier? Is there something you would Google? In the state of Utah, you can you can Google um, rehab uh, accreditations, and you can read all about that. Now, is there? This is going to sound silly. Is there a Yelp like for recovery centers? Oh yeah, you can you can type that into Yelp. Okay, and and and, yeah. and, 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 and I mean, I'm not saying that you base everything off of a Yelp, but sometimes you like to read. Most of the things I eat are based off of Yelp. Oh, all right, okay, okay. Oh, I'm just kidding. No, you're a Yelp no, guy. But yeah, I like the Yelp actually. But um, no, you can type that into Yelp and Google. But I would go ahead and read up on you know the state of Utah does a really good job. The reason we have a variety of uh, these types of programs is the state of Utah has been invested in uh, giving. Uh, people the opportunity to create them but going along with that they have to have oversight so there's there's good okay. accreditation and and licensure for that the if a, you, you should probably read last up one on. well i want to do two more i'm giving you a bonus okay. one is just the insurance i do think that you want to first start with what's available to me not worrying about insurance and money and i know that's counterintuitive to people but i would say just for the moment when you're first looking into it set that aside just try to find your top, you know, a few quality programs that you think are going to work for you or your family member based on these things we've talked about, and then see if any of those are also covered by your insurance. Then that would be the perfect match. Don't do it the other way because you're you may end up just going purely based on because yeah. it's covered by insurance. And do your research, and we're going to get more into that. We'll do a whole show yeah. on insurance and how to do that. Right. We'll have we'll have some experts come yeah. in and talk with us. What's about the that. bonus one? The bonus one is, and maybe the most important in my opinion. What level of support is provided for aftercare? When you're done at 45 days, is it, hey, see you later? Or do they send you out the door with an aftercare plan and and hopefully you've made some appointments already to, for follow-up with doctors and therapists so that you're not just going back to your same old life? And there's a lot that's called it. They, they call it an IOP, yeah. intensive outpatient. Intensive outpatient. And so a, a good quality rehabilitation program is going to have a good quality aftercare plan for each of of the people that graduate. All right. And if you want these uh, questions, we're going to have them listed on our Facebook page so you can go there and and check them off and write them down as you're researching. And once again, if you've got any questions, feel free to DM us on our Facebook page. Yeah, happy to. And we can always send you a a Jack Handy thought of the day. That's right. Or I don't know. I'm full of quotes. I'll I'll leave you with with one more and then we'll cue the music. Hold on. Here we go. Um... You don't get over an addiction by stopping using. You recover by creating a new life where it's easier to not use. If you don't create a new life, and then all the factors that brought you to your addiction will catch up with you again. Wow. That's deep. Okay, let's go.